And God bless you today. It's always a joy to have you here. And, you know, sometimes Your you thousand wonder, dollars you cannot business. reproduce so until it enters so into a covenant with the soul. Baptist Church will pick at their funeral. You can put that thousand we will remind the living that you can still repent and obey. Live from the Mecca of Mormonism, Salt Lake City, Utah, this is Heart of the Matter, where biblical Christianity meets American evangelicalism face to face. I'm your host, Sean McCraney. We praise the true and living God for allowing us to have this ministry, to be a part of it. We think it is truly his. We want it to be, at least. We pray that his spirit is upon you and us tonight as we explore these different things. Just an FYI for those of you who live in the Salt Lake City area, the city of Murray has finally allowed us to assemble in a building where we stream Heart of the Matter Evangelical. We had our first verse-by-verse -verse services two days ago as a result. Of course, all are welcome. You can get all the information of where we do church by going to www.campus.com. There's hyphens between the letters, as you can see there on the graphic. We're really excited about being able to put what we think is New Testament uh, Christianity uh, into action, there's two things we want you to know now that we are here in this building. First, every Sunday, 10 a.m., and then at 2.30 U.S. Mountain Time, you can live stream our verse-by-verse -verse teachings. That means if you live in Pennsylvania, you got to get up at the appropriate hour or whatever, but you can join with us by going to hotm.tv, click on live streaming, just like you've done for Heart of the Matter, and you can go through the verse-by-verse -verse, uh, studies that we're doing through the Bible. We're in the Gospel of John in the morning at 10. We're only really into the first few verses already. And uh, we're in Hebrews at 2.30 in the afternoon mountain time. So really, we're doing this for those people who have trouble getting outside. Uh, obviously prisoners, but I don't know if you can watch live streaming on computers in prison, but if you can, great. But also people of limited mobility, or uh, lack of transportation to a brick and mortar church. We hope that uh, you can uh, benefit by this somehow. Tell your friends. We also hope those of you who, who attend a local church, and it's very good to do that, uh, that you would use our streaming uh, services maybe to enhance your uh, understanding of the Bible. So that's the first announcement beginning this coming Sunday. And from that point forward, we'll be streaming on Sundays, 10 and 2.30, our verse-by-verse -verse teachings uh, through the Bible, especially for those who are physically confined to where they live. The second announcement is we've built this studio to be used. It is uh, uh, our king's, so if you live in Utah and you're Christian, we invite you to use it for his purposes. Um, we have technical abilities to produce top-of-the-line television productions we intend to get more. Uh, we're going to add cameras and things, but, but the back end of the studio is, is the top of the line equipment. So uh, if you're a pastor who wants to get a specific teaching or teachings or a recorded message out for your website or uh, uh, for television, even for like TV20, if you want to get on TV20 and you want to have your program done, or if you have a specific ministry or you're an apologist, or even if you're just a Christian who wants to get something down on a CD and get it duplicated, whatever, we're equipped to, we're equipped to do your production, and uh, we want to do it, and we want to serve. This is not a money-making venture. We want to serve the body here in Utah. The only qualifier is you... Uh, you have to be a biblical Christian, and your message can't contain blab it and grab it, name it and claim it, faith healing craziness stuff, uh, or any kind of heresies. Just be a just read the Bible and do that, and uh, no snakes. <laughs> um, and so we invite any and all Christians uh, and their churches, um, even those people who band together and got kicked off of TV20, those pastors and people who are behind that. You're welcome. 
come and use the studio and, uh, and the facilities to further what's going on here. Tell your pastor uh, about this, and we're going to have an open house in about a month and invite everybody we know and all the churches to come and see what's going on here. So keep that uh, in mind. We received a news article from Janice C. from the UK. It's an expose written about TBN, the owners and their finances, Jan and Paul Crouch. I've seen Jan and Paul Crouch a number of times in a mall called South Coast Plaza in Southern California. And it's right across from that, that place they meet in. And the, the, the article points out that the money that they have pleaded for and begged for on TBN, which stands for Totally Bogus Network, um, they have used really discreetly and for uh, the Lord's uh, kingdom, they've bought 13 mansions, uh, a $50 million jet, and a $100,000 motor home just for their dog so to travel around. So um, uh, we've talked a lot about church and money, but the Bible is really clear when it comes to this topic. Jesus said in Luke 16, 13, no servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, the word mammon is a Chaldaic word, and it means wealth. You cannot serve, no true servant of God can serve both wealth and it's not just money, it's wealth and God. In several places, Paul, in describing the qualifications for um, bishops or pastors and deacons, he says the line, they cannot be given to filthy lucre. That's, that's, that's money. Uh, and, and that means money in and of itself or acquiring lots of it and that being your sole objective. Now, we have to make money in this, in this life. We know that. But making it that a primary objective of yours instead of helping others, uh, Paul says you, you shouldn't be a pastor or a deacon. Jesus, in the parable of the sower, he says this, and I think it's very fitting. One of the soils, he says, is thorny ground. And he says, that which fell, meaning the seeds among thorns, are they which when they have heard the gospel, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. That's in Luke 8, 14. We know the story of the rich young ruler and what the Lord said to him. Uh, we know that Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You wanna know what you worship? What is it? What's the thing that you treasure most? What is the most important thing? Just close your eyes, think. What's the most important thing in my life? That's where your treasure is. If it's a chick, if it's a guy, if it's money, if it's drugs, if it's Saturday Night Live, whatever it is, whatever comes to your mind first, if that's what I treasure most, that's where your, that's where your focus is. That's why Jesus said, you know, if you love father, mother, brother, sister more than me, you're not worthy of me. And so if you closed your eyes and thought my child is the most important thing, you're serving a false God. I know, and that's really kind of harsh to say. In this world, yes, we make our family very important, but you know, if it's not God who comes to mind, you've got a problem. And we know that John the Beloved plainly said, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world, 1 John 2, 16. So how these people and those who endorse them can in the service and name of Jesus live like this is beyond me. It's beyond me, especially knowing that the Bible tells them they are in error. And yet believers who know the Bible watch them and, 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 and support it. Back when I was in the school of ministry, we were told that there's three G's uh, that take down pastors, three general G's, uh, girls, glory, and gold. Uh, I completely understand from firsthand experience how and why these three G's uh, will bring people who are in ministry and pastors down. Uh, when men are held up as icons of power or they get respect or they have influence, there are certain types of girls or women who are attracted to this type of appearance, that's what it is, it's an appearance, and they start coming out of the woodwork and giving attention um, on, on these people, uh, where the people who know them, like their spouses, know what they're about, and, and they don't get the same attention from them. Simultaneously, some pastors, in the face of this attention or, and or success, they start believing their own press, 
and they begin basking in the glory, so to speak, uh, and, and their apparent power. And then sometimes when the coffers start getting full of funds, they lose what may have been their original perspective and they start to try to get more and more funds and then we come into that money bit. I don't judge men who fall prey to these temptations. Um, they're enticing intoxicants and they're constantly on you uh, when you're in a place where people look to you for advice. I mean, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, physicians, they have the same type of thing. They have an engagement. People look to them as places of authority, counselors, et cetera. And so there's always that, 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 this thing that kind of comes with that. But I do fault uh, those who either make these failures their lifestyle uh, and or they justify their actions, especially in the name of God. That's when you have a big problem. If people fall and fail, I'm not gonna say anything, let God deal with them, but when you start justifying it or you make it your lifestyle, you got a problem. In a rather fascinating compendium of cult leaders, a book I had, which I loaned out, and it's never been returned, and I read it years ago, and I can't remember the title of it, but uh, nearly every single cult leader of hundreds of these cults from the beginning of time all the way back, Rasputin and all these people, they almost every one of them personally had or embodied one of the three G's, if not all three G's. Uh, in a glaring example, the founder of Mormonism, Joseph Smith Jr., was all about, I mean all about, all three G's. Uh, and like most Christian cult leaders, he did it all in the name of God. So we know about the girls in Smith's life, don't we? At least 33 secret wives, may have been more, um, many of them teenagers. He's in his 30s and 40s, and they're in the 14, 15, 16. And um, many of them were married to other men when, they took, when he took them on as wives, and he justified that in the name of God. We read about that in Todd Compton's and Sacred Loneliness and books like that. So um, we also know about the glory too. We know that he had himself ordained king of the world in Nauvoo in his heyday. He rode around uh, that city in full military, military regalia and a, uh, with a riding crop and a sword. And um, he even said things like this familiar quote, which I'm sure you've all seen. I have more to boast of than any man had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. A major majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. Never has done such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. That's in history of the church. But not too many people know about the import money had to Smith. Um, of course, he started off his life as a teen and young adult, uh, pretending to be able to see buried treasure and uh, on people's land for which he was charged and convicted. These are all old stories, I know you know. But when Smith discovered that people actually believed and bought into his religious tales, he uh, perpetrated a financial fraud upon them in the name of God too. In 1837, he claimed to have an audibly heard message from God that told him to establish a bank. And he said that, quote, like Aaron's rod, this bank would swallow up other banks and grow and flourish and spread from the rivers to the ends of the earth and survive when all other banks are ruined. That's a quote from the Painesville Republican. Wilford Woodruff, fourth president of the Mormon Church, wrote in his very own personal journal that Joseph's revelation from God on January 6, 1837, and he said, I heard Joseph, President Joseph Smith Jr. declare that he had received that morning the word of the Lord upon the subject of the Kirtland Bank, Kirtland Safety Society, that's the bank. He was alone in the room by himself and he had not only heard the voice of the spirit upon the subject, but even an audible voice, end quote. As a result of this audible revelation, Smith set up an illegal bank. He printed illegal currency and he built thousands, a million, many, not millions, many, many people out of thousands and thousands of dollars. When the bank was declared illegal uh, because the state legislature would not grant it a charter, Mormonism's founders, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, changed, craftily changed the name of the bank 
and then continued to operate the fraudulent financial institution under the new name. When the, the thing was finally shut down, well before the news of it had gotten out to the public at large, Smith went to Canada to preach, and while he was there, he passed what he knew were illegal and worthless notes of defunct currency to trusting and unsuspecting people. According to Fran Brody in her book, No Man Knows My History, Smith's successor, Brigham Young, also passed approximately $10,000 Back, way back then in the 1830s of this currency through several different states. In the end, Smith and his sidekick, Sidney Rigdon, faced 13 lawsuits totaling demands for $35,000, and Smith was arrested seven times in four months. Uh, he and Rigdon escaped from a sheriff's custody on the night of February 12, 1838, made their way on horseback under the guise of darkness of night, to Missouri and escape as escapees from the law. Don't believe me? Go to www.utlm.org. You can read about firsthand witnesses and accounts of this from LDS leadership. But the point is, the Bible says it very well, whether you're a cult leader or a Christian charlatan, the love of money is the root of all evil, which is gonna take us into tonight's message, not about money, but first let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you and pray that you'll be with us tonight. Help me to speak the things that you want and to reach people who are searching for truth, who just want the facts about everything that they can find. We pray for this in our staff and those who volunteer. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so last week, we talked about the false notion that exists within Christianity that suggests bigger is better when it comes to doing church. After watching that show, some of you may wonder, well, what is the biblical model for doing church? At the risk of alienated everyone who's ever um, kind of liked the ministry, I'm gonna lay that out plainly, uh, what, lay out plainly what I believe that model to be, uh, and then tell you what church I think best represents that model. But first, a little history, which I hope will serve to illustrate what helped create the religious institutional monsters we see in America and elsewhere today. It appears that in the year 313, Constantine made Christianity a state religion. You know, the components of that sentence ought to make you stop right there and think. When Constantine made Christianity, the state religion. Right there, that should make a giant red flag go off uh, and uh, up the uh, flagpole. Anyway, the church from that point forward began to off and on assimilate itself into affairs of state government while government inserted itself into affairs of the church. This, this interaction began all the way back in the year 313. That's how quickly the church had become so bastardized once Jesus established it. And it automatically made Christianity a faith where our king was completely apolitical, subject to worldly operations and worldly attitudes on how you're supposed to do things. Before long, bigger actually became a necessity to meet the influx of masses of people who were forced into faith by Constantine. That's another paradoxical statement, forced into faith. It doesn't make sense. In time, Roman Catholicism began to see cathedral size and, more, and the more opulent the cathedrals, the better, as a direct indicator of divine approbation. And since they were enmeshed with the state, earthly power came right along with it. Apparently forgetting, they forgot that God's words were he'll use the meek and the weak and the base things of the world to overcome the mighty. They just kept going along and getting bigger and bigger. It's not an insignificant fact that the first recorded property a church ever owned were the catacombs in Rome or places that house the dead. By the time the Protestant Reformation came along, church and state were virtually inseparable and what the church said the state did, and vice versa. As a side note, every political attempt taken by men and women today in the name of Christ mirrors this unbiblical relationship that existed in 16th century Europe between church and state. 
Now, back then, Catholicism thrived on being in bed with the state and used that power to crush anybody who spoke against them. But what many people don't uh, realize is the Protestants at the same time and still today did the very same thing. Listen, outside of God's historically true remnant of believers, uh, church history stinks. It, it reeks to high heaven of what men have done in the name of God and religion. It reeks. Um, but uh, when Christ established his church, he said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And, and because of that, there has always been a courageous line of believers who, seeking for truth, would stand up in the face of these churches uh, that endorse things like church-state relations, infant baptism, the mass, paying indulgences to get people out of purgatory, uh, worshiping Mother Mary, priesthood authority, and only eating fish on Fridays. Um, they bravely said, no way, this is not. When, when the Bible became available and people could read it, those who read it said, no way, this is baloney what you're trying to get us to do. Let me give you a living example from recorded, authenticated history. The story of a group of courageous men and women pejoratively named the Anabaptists. The place was Switzerland and the year was 1525, January of 1525 to be exact. On what would obviously be a cold night, a dozen or so men broke from the established indivisible church state law that said nobody can be baptized outside of the power of the church, whether it be Protestant or, or Catholic, wherever Protestantism or Catholicism was reigning, the law said you cannot be baptized by someone else, all right? And those churches, both Lutheranism and Catholicism, baptized infants, well, these Anabaptists came along and said, infant baptism, one, is nowhere in the Bible. Two, it doesn't make sense if it takes faith to be saved and we are baptized as a result of our faith. Why would an infant be baptized? We don't believe it. And so they got together on that January night and they baptized each other as adults. To make matters worse or better, depending on how you look at it, they then went out and courageously baptized throngs of other people who knew something was wrong too. What punishment did they face, if any, for standing up for the biblical model and for their faith in the Lord? Death. Churches were putting people to death for being baptized outside of their authority. And the first five true leaders of this nascent Christian collective, Conrad Grebel, Felix Manns, George Blaurock, Hans Lenginger, and Michael Statler were put to death through one means or another. Conrad Grebel, who was put in prison for his rebellion in the name of Christ, died of illnesses brought on by long-term incarceration for being baptized outside of Catholic or, and or Protestant, not and or, Catholic or Protestant authority. Felix Mann's hands and legs bound was thrown into a river and drowned. While the religious institutionalists were tying him up, he screamed with a loud voice, God, into thy hands I commend my spirit. George Blaurock and Hans Langinger were first tortured on August 14, 1529 with... Um, the idea that the torture would cause them to give up the names of other Anabaptists that had too uh, embraced adult baptism, believer's baptism, they called it, but it didn't work. So three weeks later, they were both burned at the stake. On the way to the place of their execution, Blaurock, he urgently screamed and shouted that all along the road who were watching him go, read the Bible. Read the Bible. Michael Sattler's martyrdom is, as William R. Estep notes, an Anabaptist hallmark. This is how the sentence for, uh, for execution read for Michael Sattler. Listen to this. Michael Sattler shall be committed to the executioner. The latter shall take him to the square and there first cut out his tongue. 
and then forge him fast to a wagon, and there with glowing iron tongs twice tear pieces from his body. Then on the way to the site of the execution, five times more as above, then burn his body to power as an arch heretic, end quote. Listen, when uh, Statler was in the marketplace and still able to speak, he prayed for his executioners. And after they cut his tongue and tore his flesh from his body six times, twice, they tied him to a ladder and pushed him into the fire while he prayed to God for their forgiveness to the best of his ability. As soon as the ropes, many witnesses testified, as soon as the ropes were burned off from his hands, he, he took time to give a promised signal to the other brethren and sisters looking on that says, when you raised, if I raise two fingers up amidst these flames, a martyr's death is bearable. After repeated attempts to get a recantation from Sattler's devoted wife, they drowned her eight days later. Hundreds of Anabaptists followed. Thousands over the years. All men and many, many courageous women who refused the doctrines and philosophies of religion but instead chose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ into suffering and then to live and die devoted to him and his word. Where are the Anabaptists today? The courageous Christians who are willing to suffer for truth no matter the cost. I don't mean the torture, but I may, might mean the torture of alienation or standing up to the baloney that, is, that, is, that we see all around us in the name of our God who came and saved us and had nothing to do with these practices. Of course, with this being in the fallen world and in the control of dark powers and principalities, institutional religion continues to grow from that point. Anabaptism shrunk down and went on to some small divergent paths, but Catholicism and Protestantism just continued to flourish uh, and it had its, uh, and that occurred until around um, the Second Great Awakening, which occurred, uh, had the American epicenter in upstate New York in a place called the Burned Over District. The Second Great Awakening began around 1790, and it gained momentum up to around 1800, and then around 1820, the effects of membership in churches could be seen uh, to have grown within the Baptists and the Methodists. It is believed by some that this revival was a reaction against growing skepticism, deism, and what might be called rational Christianity, uh, but that's conjecture. There's no real history behind that. I would suggest that institutional religion had taken a toll on the minds and hearts of the masses, and they, too, like the Anabaptists before them, they wanted truth, and lacking it, maybe they turned to intellectualism and started saying, look it, the church is a joke. What, they, what they're trying to tell us is true. I just don't get it anymore, so I'm gonna become more intellectual in my beliefs and kind of step away from faith, and they called it Christian rationalism. Stoking the fires of this revivalistic period were some major players, including men like Charles Finney, Alexander Campbell, and Barton Stone. All of them fanned their thoughts through millennialist flames. They said, listen, the millennium is coming. They were called millennialists, and everything from the burned out district, burned over district, they were promoting millennialism. That's what fervored the, the movement. But individually, they each contributed to greater factions within the body of Christ. Charles Finney, he introduced something called the anxious bench. This was in the 1820s uh, and before, 1810s, 20s. And this anxious bench, what it served as is the present day altar call. He introduced it. This is not a biblical thing. And in his preaching, he would speak of hell and fire and sin and damnation and would invite people to come forward and sit on the anxious bench when they, were, when they would work themselves up in an emotional, frothy state. And at the right moment, at the apex of Finney's teachings and screamings, they would burst forward crying and begging for mercy, Jesus' blood and salvation. They would flail themselves on the ground and shake violently. Today, we have the altar call which is nothing but a, a, 
it's, it's a vestige of the anxious bench, the coming forward, the doing this. Not, not biblical, not biblical. At another corner of the field, which is right and ready to harvest, were men like Alexander Campbell, who fathered what were known as the Restorationist Movement. His was an appeal to restore to the earth many of the things that apparently had been lost in the early church and, and, and needed to be restored back to the church. Interestingly enough, most of Alexander Campbell's Restorationist ideas which were a precursor to Joseph Smith restoring Mormonism, so to speak, are found in the Book of Mormon. All of the themes he talked about needing to be restored, Joseph Smith incorporated into his Book of Mormon later on. In light of the fanatical zeal illustrated by guys like Finney, and by the claim that truth needed to be restored back to the earth by men like Campbell, and in the age where Christian rationalism and skeptics served as the predecessor to the day, many religious innovators begin popping up like a phoenix rising from the dust, rising from the ashes of the burned over district. And these guys and girls, they said, we don't care what the Bible says as much anymore. We're gonna add our own revelations to what is important. And these religious innovators were all over the place, but they included uh, uh, Kellogg, uh, they included Ellen G. White, founder of Seventh-day Adventist. They in included William Miller of the Millerites. Of course, there was the Shakers. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses came later, but they came. And then, of course, there was Joseph Smith and his Mormons. At some point in time, what actually existed right during this period? What was, what was here in America representing Christianity? We had Catholics. We had Protestant denominations which were still greatly influenced by Luther, who could not cut the apron strings from Catholicism. So Luther brought in infant baptism and couldn't get rid of certain uh, things that Catholicism had. He didn't cut the ties completely, and so what that left were a bunch of different reformers to come in and say, well, we don't think this or we don't think that, and so we have tons of denominations coming out from that time. We have extra biblical groups like the Mormons, which we just talked about, and the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they were unafraid to concoct their own ideas. And then we had orbiting around these other kind of new Christian movements that were more biblical but still fringy. And uh, then we had a remnant of true believers like the Anabaptists who had the Bible. They read it. They knew what was right. They knew what was not. And they said, I'm going to follow what this says and not care what religion has to, to say to me today. As early American explorers and pioneers made advances further and further west and the Industrial Revolution overtook the mindset of most U.S. citizens, I would suggest that organized religion from the traditional denominations to the cults followed the Industrial Revolution's corporate methods and leads and begin to institutionalize religion in a way that we do not see in the Bible. From the late 1940s, most religious institutions, with the possible exceptions of some backwater charismatics who were still, you know, they were handling snakes and, and, and those guys, but most religious institutions had adopted a business-like attitude when it came to doing church. By the 1950s, whether you were a Catholic, a Protestant, or a Mormon, you attended church looking like you worked for IBM. That was the way America did church. And with its corporate mentality infusing its way into the religious personality of all churches, bigger became better. Researching this, a Dr. Scott Thuma wrote a book in 1996 that thoroughly explored through years of arduous research, churches that adhere to the notion that bigger is better, they are known today as megachurches. According to his research, the bigger, is big, the bigger is better attitude didn't exist before 1955. It was nowhere to be found. And was not truly apparent until the 1980s, what we sometimes refer to as the me generation, or the me decade. When it comes to the megachurch model, that's an appropriately uh, termed decade. Thuma suggests a number of factors contributed to the formation of these giant churches, which is defined as having 2,000 members or more. One conclusion is that mega or bigger is an American idea, bigger being better, or the fulfillment of the American dream. So uh, Christian churches in America begin to liken 
what religion and, and everything about Christianity, they begin to tie it into the quote unquote American dream. Uh, an author, as the author, he cites a bunch of different pastors saying things. One pastor, uh, he actually said, here's a quote, quote, nobody ever started a business without hoping that someday if he or she worked hard enough, it would be a big success. That is the American dream, isn't it? End quote. So that pastor was justifying their approach to making church big, big, big with somebody who's pursuing an entrepreneurial uh, uh, venture and, and hoping that it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Is it as apparent to you as it is to me what's wrong with that quote, especially when we compare it to the biblical narrative? First, no matter how many ways till Sunday people want to say church is business, it is not business. It, when it becomes business, you have a huge problem. And when they make quotes like that, uh, I mean, church, what is it for? We're going to get to that next week. But it's a place for people to become disciples through spiritual means. It is not a business. And when it becomes a business, it needs to change the course it's taken. Uh, in fact, biblically speaking, church isn't even a place for non-believers to come to learn about Jesus. Did you know that? Never in the Old Testament were people part of house churches who weren't believers. I mean, that's, the, that's part of the missional effort. Churches will send out missionaries to reach people, and they come to church then, and they can investigate and sit and watch it, or visitors can come, but they're not part of the church. That's never been part of the church. And so that completely eradicates the notion of seeker-friendly churches. That's, that's it's an oxymoron. It makes no sense, and we're going to give justification for that in very strong terms next week. More on that later. In the end, at least a large part of American evangelicalism and its leadership and adherents have come to believe that bigger is a sign from on high that they are doing church right, and a great deal of those equate doing church with doing business. Listen to this quote from an administrator of Chapel Hill Harvester Church in Georgia as he defends the rigid managerial business techniques he's incorporated into their church as a means to govern it. He said, it's just good business practices that we all need. We are a church, but we are also a business that happens to be operating by the name of a church. We are a $10 million a year church that has to operate like a business, end quote. First of all, ask yourselves, how did one church become a $10 million a year business enterprise? Did their leadership ever take steps to limit the size so that other people, the people who come could be literally discipled, literally called by name, literally fellowship with people who know each other? They're in a body. The body members all should know each other within the congregation. How could that pastor ever allow a church to get to be receiving revenues of $10 million or more? Uh, the answer is uh, the leadership never stopped it. And that tells us how churches become multi-million dollar business enterprises. It all begins and ends with the pastors, the leadership, the men who are supposed to know the biblical model and implement it, but they ignore it to satisfy their own ego and the American dream rather than adopt the model that God presents, which we're going to get to next week. Let's open up the phone lines, 801-590-8413, 590-8413. Off air question. Let me drink some of this poison right now in a very smelly cup. And now very terrible tasting poison. What are your thoughts on repentance? Do you have to continually repent after you've been saved? It's a great question. It's greatly misunderstood by most people too. This is it, I'll try to, God help me to remember, okay? The word repentance means to change your mind. The coin of salvation, pretend I have a coin in my hand, the coin of salvation, on one side of that coin is faith, on the other side is repentance, changed your mind. It doesn't mean I've repented of my sins in the sense that I have changed my actions perfectly. This is where the word repentance gets really mixed up. People think that when, re when you repent, you're able to change your actions. That's not what repentance means. From the Greek, it means you change your mind about your actions. So I have a habit of punching people out. I, I don't know who Christ is, and I come to faith. 
I have the coin of salvation in my hand, so I come to faith, I believe on him. On the other side is the word repent. What have I changed my mind about? I've changed my mind about who he is and who I am relative to him. I've also changed my mind about the goodness of punching people out. Does it mean I'm able to never punch someone out again? No, no, because you're not gonna reach perfection while you're in the flesh. But it does mean it starts in your mind and your mind says, I think it's wrong to punch people out. That's where it's gotta start. And then it starts to be incorporated into your actions. Will you fail throughout your life? Will you die a perfect person? Never. So when you say repentance, you have to understand what it means in the terms of the Greek. It means to change your mind about an action. You don't like it. You don't necessarily appreciate it. You want it to go away, but sometimes it doesn't. But your faith in Jesus keeps you going, and that's what that's all about. The second thing, do you have to continually repent throughout your life? Well, let me ask you a question. When you come to believe in Jesus, the faith side of that coin, what are you believing in? You believe he died for you, for all your sins, what sins did he die for? The sins you did in the past, the sins you've done in the present, and the sins you have done in the future. He has paid for all of them. When did he do that? 2,000 years ago. So he's paid for all of them, okay? Paid, done. So if you fail and you sin, as the Bible describes sin, do you have to repent for that sin? Why would you repent for that sin? It's been paid for. 2,000 years ago by Christ, past, present, and future. But what caused you, what caused you to commit that sin? Lack of faith, lack of love. So you repent for allowing your flesh, which doesn't operate by faith and love. You say, Lord, help my, my failure. Help my failure in not believing. Help my failure in not loving. That's what you're repenting of. You're not repenting of every individual sin. Okay, today I, you know, I, whatever. I did this, you know. You will be on a hamster wheel that never ends, and you will seek and strive for individual perfection through that hamster wheel, forgetting all the facts about sin being taken care of, past, present, and future. You are justified. You are sanctified. You are his. The moment you believed, all right, you're his. So when you repent as a believer, you say, oh, God, you know, I... I punched the guy out, you know. I, Lord, I, I know it's a really vile uh, explanation, but I, I'm sorry that I didn't have the faith to trust that you would handle that guy later on down the road. I'm sorry I didn't love him and turn the other cheek as you told me to. That is what repentance is in the Christian community. Unfortunately, it's not understood, and so people, you need to repent. And what does that mean to them? You need to change your ways so that you are acceptable to all of us. And that is not the the meaning of repent. It means to change your mind. So someone commits an egregious sin and they're in the church. The person stands up and says, you know, I think it's okay to uh, have relations with my dog and I think everybody ought to do it. They haven't changed their mind. So the church then says, we're gonna separate you out because you're really a danger to people who are attracted to animals. So we're gonna separate you out. However, the person comes up and says, you know, I've made a mistake with... (laughs) <laughs> an animal, and, uh, and I just, I wish I didn't have this problem. Oh, Lord, uh, help me in my faithlessness. Help me in not loving my neighbor who owns a dog or whatever, and, and see, that's, and then, then the church says, we are here for you. We, we understand that. That's the humble attitude. That is how the New Testament describes it, and that is how uh, it, much of it is lost. We're going to Stephanie in Tennessee, and then Jeff in Danbury, Connecticut. Stephanie in Tennessee. Stephanie, you're on the you're on the air. No, it's my reading. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes. Hello. Can, Can you, you hear, hear me? me? Yes, I hear you now. I hear you now. If I wasn't hearing anything before, uh, hey, glad I got in. Um, I had a quick question for you. Um, I'm making a move from, from Tennessee to Salt Lake for work. Um, I've always been a Southern Baptist, but in researching for uh, different things with Salt Lake City, of course, came across Mormonism, and I really got um, enamored by the LDS culture. And part of what you were talking about earlier made me think about um, part of my experience. When I met with missionaries um, over a course of about three months, um, many times they told me I would be helping to fulfill a Mormon prophecy 
about spreading the Mormon message and word in the South. I would help them to uh, prove to others that uh, the LDS Church was Christian, help them to make it bigger, and those sorts of things. Now, I've done a lot of research uh, since this experience, and I've never uh, come across anything online or any videos, just nothing where uh, missionaries have talked about people they spoke to helping to uh, fulfill prophecy. I, I just, uh, it's actually bothered me really a lot in the past uh, week or so, and I've prayed a lot about it. And, uh, you know, I came across your videos and thought maybe you would have some insight. Okay, Stephen, um, first and foremost, if they were missionaries, they often will appeal to any means necessary to convince you that you are very important, that you are a, born a child of God, and that you are needed in the Mormon kingdom. So they will say things to really appeal to your ego and pride and flesh. You're such a great man. You could be used so greatly in the kingdom of God. And if you don't know, uh, you know the Bible, you can be, you, and even if you do, you can be drawn in by that type of thing. I don't know what uh, uh, prophecy they're speaking of. There's some general prophecies that uh, Joseph Smith gave uh, about the Native Americans. I'm not sure about the South, unless it had something to do uh, with the... I don't really know, but that does not ring a bell with me. It doesn't mean it isn't true, but I don't recognize it at all. And I would guess that the missionaries were just appealing to you and trying to get you to help. Maybe they just generally were speaking that the Mormons believe that the Mormon church is like the, uh, the uh, stone cut out of the mountain without hands that rolls forth in Daniel and fills the earth. And maybe generally they were talking about you helping to bring that to pass. The Mormons assign that passage in Daniel to themselves in the church and how it grows. Does that help? Okay, that makes sense. Um, I know it was, a, it was definitely kind of one of those things, looking back, that I, I really questioned because I know um, there were a lot of things that weren't shared with me until my baptismal interview. You know, I had been told um, throughout meeting and speaking with people, uh, the missionaries, I'm sorry, that, you know, they believe salvation came through uh, faith through Christ alone, you uh -huh. know, and that's, of course, what I grew up believing. But when I did the baptismal interview, I was finally told, of course, um, you know, baptism is what cleanses you of sin, and then they talked about sacrament meeting, renewing your covenants, and, um, you know, I felt really awful. I was supposed to be baptized like two days later, and I, you know, I went home, I prayed a lot, and I called a, a, a friend of mine who happens to be a pastor, and luckily I didn't... Uh, go through the baptism, but I know that was just one of the things that I uh, reflected on, and it seemed to be relevant to what you were talking about tonight, and I never was able to find anything relevant to that. Hey, Stephen, when you come, come out, out uh, uh, to, to Salt, Salt Lake, Lake City, City, look us up, and I'd love to meet you. And you too. I was looking at uh, your website and reading about campus. It uh, seems like the type of place I'd want to go to now. I'm very, uh, when I was a child, we were, uh, I was actually Catholic, but not practicing because of uh, some things with my father, but uh, I, I did come to Christ in high school and just kind of got mixed up in this. And, but uh, I've, I've really reevaluated a lot of things and just every day reading the Bible and uh, everything I've read about campus seems very, very, um, very much like the type of, of Christians I would want to be around. Well, come visit us. You might like it, you may not, but I'm really glad you didn't join the LDS Church, Stephen. Good job. Thank you so much. Keep doing the good work you're doing. God bless you. God bless you. Talk, Talk to you later. later. Bye bye. Uh, did we lose the other caller from? Oh, Jeff from Danbury, Connecticut. Jeff, you're on the air. Jeff, you're on the air. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Quick question. Um, I know as believers, we're all at the church trying to study the scriptures and approach a pastor or a teacher when they're incorrect, like, like the men of Berea. So yeah. my question was, if, you know, with tithing and a lot of these issues that I think a lot of us believers have been convicted about, is what is the best suggestions you may have of how to approach pastors? Because it seems like the church is set up today where you're no longer noble. You're going to be like a problem if you, you know, rebuke a pastor. So I want to see if you give me a suggestion, like what's the best delicate way we could do this. I think you just answered it delicately. Uh, I, I have to admit, you know, and I'm a pastor um, and I do have an ego. Pastors have egos. You have to have one almost to be one. 
and they get into many pastors. There are some very humble, quiet, kind, Bible-type pastors who are the salt of the earth, who I love, who you can approach, and they will dialogue with you. But it seems like to me, and I know this is a hasty generalization, but today, pastors who are like my age and down, they're pretty darn arrogant. And so you approach them, they would just rather say, hey, go, to some, go somewhere else. We have enough people here. Uh, so delicately is really important. I would just take them and say, can I come talk with you? And uh, just say, just help me understand the New Testament principle of tithing. And, and I just wanna know this. Help, help me see and see what his reaction is. If it's abrasive and explosive, then get away from them. Uh, and many of them are. They, they will just explode and be abrasive because unfortunately it hasn't, it, it, the, the idea of a shep, sub-shepherd shepherding sheep in the flock, knowing their names, having a relationship with them has been lost because of the numbers game. And so when you create a problem in something that is trying to generate numbers, it, they better, they'd rather get rid of you than to try to help bring you along. If you have a pastor who's willing to take the time and sit down and talk with you and rationally discuss his things in love, you know, that is worth its weight in gold. If he sticks to his position of tithing, that may not be a hill to die on. He may want to stick to that and believe it. I don't think he can prove it in the New Testament whatsoever. Uh, but I think they can pull from the old and, and try to establish it. But nevertheless, it's gonna be the demeanor and love that that pastor has in dialoguing with you that you're gonna be able to see if his heart is for God or if his heart is for collecting that tithing. Okay, so privately is probably the best, not publicly. <laughs> yes. Review. Yeah, don't, don't stand, stand up, up and uh, call. Heretic! <laughs> no, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, privately is the best way, Jeff. You're on the right course. All right, my brother. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. All right, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for calling. calling. All right. Bye-bye. Hey, hey, okay, okay, listen. Uh, I'm going to quickly say we have a list in front of us of all the people in California, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Mississippi, Nebraska, Nevada, New Jersey, Ohio, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Texas, Utah, Virginia, and Washington, Alberta, Canada, Ontario, and the United Kingdom are all watching right now. We had this report several weeks and we've seen it each week, it's the same type. This is, we ask you to do this. Go tell your friends about the program. Tell your friends about Heart of the Matter, where, what, whatever time you're watching it, just do us a favor so we can help continue to grow and we can keep the ministry growing like this. And you're gonna say, well, bigger is better. Bigger is better in ministry, I'm telling you. And so tell them to watch. There's no, you can watch in silence. We never know who you are but just help, the, help it grow so maybe we can uh, uh, invoke some kind of change uh, amongst the masses. And so um, that's what we're asking you guys in all those states who are watching right now. Go and see if you can invite one or two people, whatever, to also check out the show on Tuesday nights at whatever time it airs for you. Got a message from Tim. Uh, it's about love. Just wanted to let you know when you say you love LDS people, you are lying. I just, I have seen the way you treat LDS people, the email says. No, you haven't seen the way I treat LDS people. You've seen the way I treat LDS people who call a television program and uh, try to debate about what they really believe and what they don't. That's what you've seen. I live in a neighborhood full of LDS people. I get along with all of them. Uh, we take them our leftover bagels and they receive them gladly. And I have Joseph Myth stickers on my cars. Uh, so I get along very well with people one-on-one. -on -one. But on a television program or an internet program, when people call and they want to prove a point that I know is a lie, that's when you see me treating them in a certain way. Additionally, and we cover this constantly, love comes in a lot of different forms. And you know, my kind of love, as I've said before, is like the love a parent will have when a kid is standing out in the middle of the street and a five-ton truck is barreling down his direction to scream, get the heck out of the way, get out of the street. That is love, that motivates someone to do it. So I realize it's not always the most favor, most acceptable type of communication, but it is done in love. Uh, we have an email from Brian. He says, long time viewer, uh, I, I'm pumped about the new direction of the show, supporting you guys on the YouTube expansions. Uh, one area of misunderstanding and downright heresy I hope you will cover is about lordship salvation. Um, 
This is a term that categorizes in one way or another people who justify salvation by faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, and in some way add works-based doctrine into salvation, either at the front end, you have to do some work at the front end in order to receive it, or at the back end, you have to do some work uh, work in order to uh, keep it. And uh, he names, and I don't know if these guys are, I'm just reading it, Paul Washer, John MacArthur, Ray Comfort, Kirk Cameron, John Piper. And th- he says, in my opinion, these guys are dangerous to the good news as the Benny Hens and the other prosperity teachers because they deny justification by faith by adding works uh, 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 up front or on the back end. So I wrote him back and said, listen, we are going to cover Lordship Salvation. We're gonna give our best uh, assessment of it, what it really entails based on their theology, and then we will uh, present it on a program in the months to come, and we'll try to do it justice. I am not informed uh, enough about it to make a comment on it right now. We received, because of past shows, a number of very sincere but urgent people who are writing that I have to, if I am any sort of Christian, believe there was a worldwide flood that the creation actually occurred in six 24-hour periods. Uh, And if I don't, then I could no way possibly believe in the resurrection of Christ, in heaven and hell, in miracles. And if I don't accept the Genesis account as it's written, then I am not a Christian. Uh, So we are going to be getting into that, and uh, we're going to present to you some astounding biblical supports Uh, that contextually take and show you do not have to and that that other biblical writers did not use the term day, meaning 24-hour periods, all over the Bible. We can also show many uh, different scholars who believe uh, in an old earth, not in the new earth, meaning it wasn't done in six days, 24-hour periods, but it was done over periods, grand periods of time. Norman Geisler is an old earth Uh, proponent, meaning he does not accept the 24-hour creation periods. So whether you do or don't, that's not a hill to die on, in my opinion. The hill to die on is Jesus real? Was he the I am? Did he live, die, raise, third day, ascend to heaven, sit on the right hand of the throne? Grace, you're saved. Are those things in your faith walk? That's Those are the things. This stuff is not. But when you try to make those things part of of the salvation experience, I guess maybe you're guilty of... uh, of lordship discipleship, I don't know. We'll find out. Hey, we're down at the end. We uh, hope you'll check out the website, www.hotm.tv, and also check out the NRB uh, channel on DirecTV, Friday nights and Tuesday, Tuesday mornings, where we air Heart of the Matter Mormonism therein. Remember, tell your pastors, if you live in Utah or know a pastor or apologist, somebody in ministry in the state who needs production, Uh, done to give us a ring. Uh, Go to uh, hotm.tv. You can email us and tell us what you want to do. As long as it's not during the time when we're using the studio, it's yours, and we will set you up and get things done. So with that, we'll see you next week here on Heart of the Matter. Glory to the shepherds of